the fact that government re, Democrats and Republicans control the government, or is there something more fundamental going on? Now, tonight we just want to cover a few basics because the 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 subject matter is huge, right? This is something that volumes and volumes have been written about. So you might think of this, if this were a trial, this would be more like the opening statement and not all of the evidence, right? We're not gonna be able to do a deep dive into all of this, but we wanna go over a few basics, including what is capitalism? Because this is a subject of a lot of confusion. Uh, Mel's gonna talk about that primarily. I'm going to talk about the concept of exploitation and the fact that exploitation is a predominant feature of capitalism. And then both of us are going to talk about three examples of how we believe and how we conclude that capitalism lies at the root of social ills we face today, using the examples of poverty and economic insecurity, environmental de devastation, and war, imperialism, militarism. So with that, I'm going to relinquish my screen again, turn it back over to Mel to talk about what capitalism means. Thanks, Rich. Um, so, uh, yeah, when we want to talk about capitalism, I mean, you know, people are like, well, of course, capitalism is ruining the planet, like, and then gestures wildly around them, right? And, um, you know, it, it, we're not here really to discuss whether capitalism is the problem, right? I think all of us who are here, who registered through the Green Ego Socialist Network, um, you know, sort of understands like sort of that general point. Um, and if you don't, we can talk about that in our discussion later. Um, but, you know, part of what we, we do want to do if we're going to turn the ship around, right, is to really think about why capitalism is a problem. How do we think about it? And also like, how do we kind of express that um, to other folks who may not be in the same anti, you know, of course, anti-capitalist boat. Um, and part of it too is, you know, uh, because we all live in different uh, places now, um, you know, it, it hits different, right? And and part of what, um, you know, we're, we're gonna try to do with this, uh, this, this conversation is um, to try to provide a few tools of like how to, kind of uh, tools of analysis to look at your um, particular uh, area, right? And how uh, capitalism and the climate crisis and the whole, you know, um, ecological crisis is hitting you. And, and then to, you know, have that, um, to be able to organize around it and all of that. So, um, so, so before we get into that, why capitalism is a problem, let's get the, we want, like to do a deep dive into exactly what capitalism is, what is its foundational pillars, and why are those foundational pillars uh, basically like uh, uh, the opposite or opposed to the continuation of the species and uh, a viable biosphere. So uh, I'm going to share my screen also. And um, I found this, uh, this graphic actually, um, it's quite funny on a, uh, you know, one of those libertarian reason websites. So this is actually, you know, this graphic is from a, um, uh, is from, you know, people who believe in the free enterprise system. And so this is coming, not coming from, this is also coming from Marxists because uh, they talked about this too, but, um, you know, these are generally accepted in any, you know, economics 101 as the, you know, sort of five major pillars upon which capitalism rests. And we'll go over these just in turn, but again, you know, you've got five five fingers on your hand, you can remember uh, sort of the five pillars of capitalism um, as we know it. So number one is private, oops, let me go back, private ownership of the means of production, right? We're not talking about personal toothbrushes here. We are talking about means of production, mainly land, right? And, uh, you know, control over resources and, um, and the ability to put them to, together with labor to make commodities, which is our second uh, pillar of capitalism. And by commodities, we mean goods, you know, goods and services, things that are made for a market or a market economy. But we'll also talk about com commodification of the natural resources that were not 
necessarily made uh, for sale in a capitalist market. We also talk about wage labor as a, a fundamental pillar of capitalism. And when we talk about, and Rich will talk about part of it. But one of the things that, you know, where it all kind of comes together is that, you know, wage labor is treated within capitalism as a commodity, right? Number four, we're going to talk about profit maximization, right? What, uh, what folks, what some economists sometimes call economic man or the rational economy, economic man, like to that every, you know, the assumption that humans exist to maximize their gain from whatever, right? So, you know, I mean, some of us are like, well, not always, but that is an assumption upon which capitalist systems and, um, and planning rests. And finally, market allocation, right? So this meaning that the um, allocation of goods and services and basic needs is, uh, is dependent through the mechanism of the quote unquote free market, okay? Capitalism, these are pretty much the five very, you know, uh, very fundamental uh, um, assumptions and concepts upon which this economic system uh, was built historically and continues to rely on today to our detriment, okay? So when we talk about private ownership of the means of production, this is really like a, like, it's almost like capitalism doesn't exist without this, right? Without uh, somebody being able to claim ownership over some kind of means, they are not able to be, to claim the profits at the end of it, right? And this goes back, you know, historically, right? And when we talk about, and, and especially when it comes to something like land, and when we think about ecosystems, when we think about biospheres, uh, you know, all of this is dependent on land, right? And so part of the transition to capitalism was, shift in the allocation and distribution of land to you know the feudal system which you know of course was you know, was uh, was hierarchical and unequal in its own way but at least it had this particular allocation of land that was you know the lord owned everything and got taxes and stuff but then forests were actually common spaces right the commons if people have heard of that the commons was um, a, a, a pretty necessary feature of feudal life. And so over a period of almost 200 years from roughly the 16th century to the 18th century, um, sorry, 17, 1700s to 1900s, that's what I mean. Um, I get that confused sometimes. Um, there was a privatization of that commons known as the enclosure movement. And that's where laws uh, and, and fences went up to basically divide up those commons that commonly owned land so that people could quote, could alienate them. You know, what we know now know as like buying and selling real estate parcels, right? Um, this is a huge uh, th uh, engine of what made capitalism uh, towards a capitalist transformation of economy. Um, private ownership could also mean something like factories, right? equipment, uh, you know, uh, factories, and also the, um, the, the, the raw materials out of which commodities are made. Um, we could also talk about in this day and age, uh, utilities. Right, that are used to as a means of production. Things like, you know, electricity, gas, um, all of the things that uh, some of you may, you know, be be uh, uh, a little short of in this polar vortex. Um, you know, we can definitely see how utilities are a necessary means of production, and we can talk about that as and a draw on natural resources. Now for commodities, right, again, we can, we can think of something like a PS5, right? This is a commodity. It's obviously a commodity. It was made by a company in a factory um, that was, that's now, then goes to your retailers. And so that's a market, right? So goods. Um, so when we talk about commodities, we don't just mean like, um, say, you know, uh, I, uh, I, I, you know, I made a chair 
and two tables. And I only need one table for myself. So I have an extra table that I'm going to sell on Facebook Marketplace or something like that. That's not, not necessarily what we mean as commodities because um, you know, just, just sort of selling your surplus of other things that you made for yourself to use isn't necessarily what we mean by like a capitalist commodification. Now, if I had a chair factory, right? And I already had chairs, I didn't need one, but I make a hundred chairs so I can make pure profit off of it. That's what we mean by commodity production, right? So things that are produced specifically for sale on an open market. We can also think about services. Um, well, also uh, real estate, right? Um, is also something that is a commodity, not necessarily built because somebody needs it, but because somebody wants to make profit off of it. We can also think about services in the same way too. So, um, you know, this uh, still from sorry to bother you, um, you know, guy goes in and uh, is part of a call center that is servicing something that other people have uh, are selling as a commodity that is also part a commodity as well. We can also, um, and we'll we'll talk. Uh, Rich will talk more in depth about us, but but there's also this other category of things like land, water, plants, fruit. You know, things that just grow, whether or not there's a market for it. Right? Land just exists. Water exists. Right? But they have become commodified so that they are just like uh, the division of land that we saw earlier, um, so that they can be bought and sold on a market as well. So, so uh, we, if we look at this, the sort of special category of water, land, natural resources, and human beings, by the way, right, as things that are not necessarily produced because there's a market for them out there, but they, but they exist, but then become commodified so that some capitalists can make profit off of it. That's what we mean by there's commodities and then there's commodification, okay? Um, well, all, we are also going to talk about wage labor as a commodity, and Rich will talk about the exploitation part of it and how that works. But I want to go back again to this enclosure movement to explain how wage labor got here as a commodity to um, to be bought and sold. I mean, some sometimes literally, as in the case of chattel slavery, but also, you know, when we think about our hourly wage, we're technically renting out hours of our life, right, to uh, uh, our and our productivity to other other places. Now, how did this even work within capitalism, right? You had peasants that were on the land, they had a means of subsistence, but once that enclosure process got on there, what happened to all of those peasants and all of those people? They got kicked off of the land and then were forced to move to cities or other places or become vagrants where they were then prosecuted by folks. And then they were basically put in a position where they were forced to rent out their life, right? They were forced to sell their labor in order to continue to survive, right? So as M Marx put it, um, that the land, uh, enclosure of the land and the privatization of land was um, a means also not just to get that capital, that landed capital for the means of production, but also to force uh, human beings to rely on a wage in order to live because they had been kicked off their land, because they had nowhere to live or produce their food. Um, so, so in many ways, what enclosure did was it produced the, the means of production for capitalism. Number one, um, a, a value on land, and number two, surplus human beings that would have to basically rely on the system in order to survive. So, you know, th those, those paupers that were kicked off the land then became factory workers. We, and this is a process that continues to the modern day as we now know from migrant workers um, and also in other forms like, like the gigification of labor, et cetera. Okay, so profit maximization, um, you know, means that, that you basically, uh, we are in a, the capitalism is a competitive system, right? So different capitalists will compete to make more profit, 
right? It's always about trying to make more profit than the other guy. It's also about trying to serve. And, and this isn't just because of greed. It is also because it, it's, a, it's a sort of way that you have to survive in a competitive system, right? So even the capitalists are forced to maximize their profit um, in order to uh, you know, stay afloat in a, in a competitive capitalist system. So um, what are the ways that capitalists will, what, what are the things that capitalists will use to maximize their profit? Well, this is the one they love to talk about a lot, which is innovation, right? You can make something that is new to the capitalist market, and then you kind of have a corner on that market, and then everybody wants one, right? That's one way of maximizing profit. Of course, another way of maximizing profit is to lower the labor costs, right? And of course, labor as variable, variable capital is the um, is the most uh, 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 is the first thing, right? That capitalists will try to control if they're trying to lower their costs in order to maximize profit. Um, and and then um, the and another way, and this is especially common now when you know capitalism is kind of entering this crisis point, is that you will have uh, this mergers and acquisitions, right? The other way that capitalists can try to maximize profit is to simply dominate a market, and that way they can set their own prices for it, right? We, we see this in food, um, we see this in oil, we see this in um, a, a, a number of markets, uh, we see this in media. Right? There's a number of markets that are monopolized by uh, a few capitalists. And finally, market allocation, right? Um, and you know, this is the, the concept that um, the free market and this you know, law of supply and demand is an ideal way of um, distributing the goods, services, the things that are produced by capitalism, as well as the basic needs of people, right? Um, we see this, this uh, uh, philosophy um, you know, uh, powerfully at work, of course, in the health, privatized healthcare system. Right, and that um, uh, the the uh, the sort of flawed assumption, but it is a working assumption, shall we say, that um, a free market in uh, health insurance um, is is the way that health care is distributed in this in this country, right? Um, it, and we see how well that works. I'm being sarcastic, of course. Um, you know, we can also talk about, um, and I'll talk a little bit more in depth about the California water system, because um, this is the place where I live, and this is the way that I see capitalism, uh, um, you know, problem in my particular area. But, um, but you see this, you know, there's no major city on this earth that does not have a dam attached to it right? Uh, city water supplies are managed by dams. And we can think of dams as, you know, a capitalist method of uh, banking and distributing water according to a private market, right? Um, so that's one of the concepts I'd like to introduce. And finally, we can look at something like housing, right? And the way that market allocation of housing and how a real estate and how, every, you know, almost every you know, non-socialists you'll see talking about housing, um, we'll talk about it in terms of the housing market and what the market will bear and what is fair market rate. You know, these are these terms that you can look out for to like understand what they are, what, what capitalists are, um, how capitalists conceive of, the, uh, you know, the right to shelter, right, as a market allocated uh, a commodity. Right. And so one of the things that, um, you know, uh, well, I think help um, hasn't already uh, framed uh, everything that you can see around you every day as being sort of produced by capitalism and thereby kind of like trace its specific effects. OK, um, I think that's it for now. Right. Um, I'll hand it back over to Rich to who will talk, take us into the mechanisms of exploitation. Go ahead, Rich. OK, thank you, Mel. Let me go back to my share screen here again. One moment. And let's see. Here we go. Current slide. OK, oops, we already did that one. Let me go here. OK, 
So uh, when we talk about exploitation, I think it's important to start by understanding, I'm not using exploitation in the colloquial sense, right? And, and this is important because I think there's a perception out there that, well, capitalism used to be, used to exploit people back in the late 19th century when there was child labor and the conditions were horrible and so on, but it's not that way now. Well, it is that way now. Exploitation properly understood is not something that's just referring to harsh conditions of work or oppression at the workplace, although that obviously does occur frequently at many workplaces. But we're referring to a system-wide practice that occurs every business day at every capitalist workplace. All workers, all employees, basically capitalist workers, employers, employees, all workers are exploited under capitalism. It's inherent in the system because all workers create more exchange value than they receive in the form of wages. And when I say wages in this, I'm including salaries. That's just another form of by which workers are paid. Uh, and it is inherent in the operation of capitalism because workers don't own or control any means of production, the facilities of production that, that Mel was talking about. So in order to survive, they must sell their labor power to a capitalist business or to the state, which uh, basically replicates the same relationship in order to make a living. This labor power is itself sold as a commodity, as we know, we hear even in mainstream economics, the term the labor market, et cetera. But it's important to understand that the price is not based on the value of the commodities it will be used to produce. You know, if I'm if I'm producing, uh, if I'm working at a factory that builds uh, Lexuses, that doesn't mean I'm going to get paid more than uh, a factory that's that's building Toyotas, right? It's it's um, it, it has no relationship to that. And what, what uh, Marx and other economists discovered is that basically the price of labor power is not based on, on value of commodities, but roughly on the cost of its own reproduction. In other words, the, the amount of money uh, that it takes to sustain a, a working person and allow that person to reproduce. Now, obviously there's variations within that. Some workers with higher education or specialized skills are able to obtain a better rate of pay than others, while some are pushed below subsistence level and are literally struggling to survive. But all workers are paid within a general range, especially when, when compared to the amount of wealth and income that's extracted by the capitalist owners. During the working day, the worker produces more exchange value than the exchange value created by them in the form of wages. The capitalists don't pay for it, and this is what is meant by surplus value. Now, I'm going to kind of illustrate this a little bit more. I wanted to acknowledge uh, someone whose artwork I stole a little bit, but with permission <laughs> of the author. Uh, Stephanie McMillan is a great person. I just want to allow let people know about this book. That's where these come from. And she's fine with us doing that as long as I acknowledge that she's the one that created this work. So uh, to kind of run through this a little bit, uh, we're gonna kind of do this in an abstract way and then kind of bring it more down to earth. Uh, this is one of Stephanie's illustrations about, okay, this, is, let's, this can be a widget, right? Economists like to talk about widgets. It could be anything. Something that's, that's produced for sale on a market is a commodity. Um, and uh, the, the next step in figuring out how this works is we do understand that the capitalists supply the raw materials and capital needed for production, but those factors do not add new value, right? So for, uh, in other words, if, if auto capitalists must supply $1,000 worth of steel to produce each car, they must pay that much for it. There's no new value created. It's passed on into the price of the car and there's, there's nothing to divide. But if workers add another 2,000, 3,000 or more by applying their labor to the steel and the other raw materials that are supplied by the capitalists, uh, by applying their labor, the capitalists pay only part of the new value back to their workers as wages, keeping the rest as 
surplus value. Uh, now, workers can and do struggle for better wages and conditions. They do it all the time. That's why we have this thing called the class struggle. But the overall conditions of mass unemployment limit their bargaining power to a level, as I mentioned earlier, approximating their cost of reproduction, the cost of living, cost of supporting a family, with some making a little more, but many making less and having to struggle just to survive. And of course, workers don't have much choice in the matter. It's not like, you know, I can decide, well, you know what, I'm going to be a capitalist today and uh, I'm just going to start you know, owning a warehouse or owning a factory or owning a mill or whatever, I, you know, we're, we're, we're born into a class, right, basically. And uh, there, there is very little that takes place in terms of people being able to jump from one class to the other. It does happen, but it's very rare. For the most part, uh, we don't have a choice. This is how we have to live under the system. Uh, so, I think it's also important to understand this is not just a theory. This is this is a fact. It can be empirically measured. As a matter of fact, the U.S. Department of Commerce's uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis even provides data on the rate of exploitation, but it's couched in different terminology. And this is from a recent report that I, I just lifted that talks about that. Uh, it's described in terms of, whoops, why am I not advancing? Let me try to do that. There we go. It's, it's uh, described in terms of value added. And what value added measures is the difference between the value of goods that are sold and it basically would apply to service as well and the cost of the materials or supplies that are used in producing them, including the value of the uh, capital that uh, is, you know, is, is used up uh, by uh, attrition. But when we compare value added to the compensation paid to employees in the same industries, just using the third quarter of 2020, for example, we find that workers overall were paid wages and benefits, $6.4 trillion in, in wages and benefits in the US that quarter, but they created over $10 trillion in new value, right? So this is just one concrete way of getting a sense uh, of this. This is this is a reality. And, you know, it's kind of like being in the fishbowl, right? Until you step outside and look at the fishbowl and look at the whole system and how it operates, you don't think about this during your normal working day. You think, well, you know, I go to work, I'm paid a wage or salary. That's what my labor is worth. And so that seems fair. But it's not because this is going on, right? We're creating the wealth that uh, the capitalists enjoy merely by virtue of the fact that they own it, that they own the capital, that they own the facilities of production. So this is this is basically how the system works. This is this is the normal operation of, of capitalism: is the capitalists own the the mean the facilities means of production. They own they purchase the raw materials. It is only labor power, the application of labor power, that is able to create new value in the form of commodities. To use as the example of tomatoes into ketchup, but it could be anything. It, it is only the application of labor that turns the raw materials into the ketchup, right? And and then the capitalists are able to obtain the proceeds. The entire system is predicated on that, and that's how the system works. Now, what are, I wanna just talk briefly about some of the direct consequences of this, and then we're gonna talk a little bit more about just some concrete examples of how this creates a whole host of problems. First of all, I would argue, let's not overlook this. I, I would argue that it's unfair, morally wrong in and of itself, right? That workers create all social wealth, and yet they only receive a fraction of what they produce in the form of wages while a tiny minority, you call it the 1% as we did back during the Occupy days, but the capitalist class is the more precise term. The owners of the facilities of production are able to live and live quite well by extracting wealth from the labor produced by, by workers. So this causes other problems. Obviously, to use that third quarter example, if workers were collectively paid 6.4 trillion, uh, they obviously cannot purchase the over $10 trillion worth of products. 
So there's a dislocation between uh, what uh, what workers are able to uh, buy back of all the goods and services they produce. Now, of the other 3.6 trillion, a lot of that's capital goods uh, that the capitalist purchases. A lot of it is is used in luxurious uh, product uh, consumption by the capitalists and so on. But this dislocation uh, is a problem. It is not the problem, but is one of the contradictions and problems of the capitalist class uh, that, under, that occurs under the capitalist system based on this disparity between the wealth workers create and the wages and salaries that they uh, receive. Now, they've come up with all kinds of ways of mitigating or trying to alleviate that problem, but still we, we periodically see uh, uh, crashes in, in, you know, every, every few years we get, we get a new economic crisis that occurs. Um, but then there's a deeper problem and a deeper cause of crisis besides this one. And that is what's called the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. So as Mel mentioned, in pursuit of profits, the capitalists are driven by competition into finding ways of lowering their labor and other production costs. So we know about these automation, robotization, going back ways to the Taylor method of production, other, other ways of increasing labor efficiency to produce more in less time. These things are ongoing. They're, 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 they take place uh, constantly. Now, the firm that comes up with a new innovation or way of, of saving on their costs initially has an advantage. Uh, they're able to reap more profits from, from that if they're the first firm that's able to do that in a particular sector. But sooner or later, the other companies catch on and they make the same innovation or better ones. And the overall effect over time is that the rate of profit tends to fall because what are they doing? They are eliminating the sole source of surplus value from production, labor. There, the more they eliminate labor, living labor, from the production process to make more products in less time, it becomes more capital intensive, the rate of profit relative to what they invest in the business tends to fall. And this creates a whole host of problems. Just to name a few direct examples, and, and Mel alluded to some of them earlier, driving down wages is an obvious one, right? If they're able to do it, if, if what's called the reserve army of unemployed is large enough to allow them to do it, they'll drive down wages as far as they possibly can. There's union busting there. We've seen the attacks on pensions and healthcare benefits, et cetera, in this country in recent years. <clears throat> There's the outsourcing of production to lower labor and other costs or importing cheaper labor uh, through imperialist domination of other nations. There's speed ups. There's more oppressive control of worker activity. And there's something else that Mel alluded to, and that is corporate welfare, right? Using the state to subsidize profit-making activity in various ways. The military industrial congressional complex being a chief example of that, but there's many others. What's one of the current buzzwords now, right? Public-private partnerships, that's the way to go. We keep hearing that one, right? That's another, that's another name for corporate welfare. That's another name for the state subsidizing profits at the expense of the taxpayers or through monetary policy. And of course, there's always the corporate bailouts. We've seen that time and time again, especially since 2008. At the same time, another way they're able to do that is through reducing outlays for social services. So the services that help prop up the working class in various ways, uh, those are, are, are downsized or eliminated in order to provide tax relief to the capitalists. And then a big one, is the growing predominance of finance capital. The more that capitalists are less and less able to reap profit out of normal productive activity, the more they turn to what I would call cannibal capitalism or predatory capitalism, you know, where, where the, the hedge funds buy up firms and they, they, they loot them and drive them out of business or they, you know, they, they send the operations overseas to take advantage of cheap labor. All of, all of these things uh, are, are part and parcel of it. And more and more of, of the capitalist ill-gotten gains go into finance capital, gambling on Wall Street, 
you know, the, the credit default swaps, all of that kind of activity. And as you can see, this is a quote from Stephanie McMillan's book. We, we now are living in a system dominated not only by monopoly capitalism, as Mel pointed out, but also the predominance of finance capital has grown more and more important. And, and this has all kinds of effects. I mean, more, more and more of the American working class, for example, is now employed in financial services, stuff that doesn't really create a public good. It's just serving the capitalists, right? And, and this is one of the, the outgrowths of, of this development of the system. Now, on as far as exploitation of the natural world, uh, Mel has already talked about how this has to become commodified, right? If you look at it from the perspective of the self-interested capitalist, which they all are, nature only has value to the degree that it has resources that can be extracted and turned into commodities, right? If I go out, as I, earlier today, I was chopping wood for my wood stove, right? If I go out and chop wood for, just to burn on my wood stove, that's not a commodity. I'm not going to make a profit off of that. That's for use, right? But uh, when, when capitalist firms buy huge swaths of land and plant tree farms in order to sell the lumber, well, then it becomes commodified and the, the land itself then becomes a, a commodity and, and the, the plants on it. So what we see under capitalism is this relentless pursuit of commodifying everything, right? Everything that, that they can think of, they want to turn into a commodity if they have any chance at all of making profit off of it. And that includes the land itself, topsoil, which is being depleted at, at a horrific rate. There's a story there that few people are talking about. Water, plant and animal life, whether you're talking about lumber or livestock or whatever, fossil fuels and other minerals, all of that capitalism commodifies, turns into commodities that can be converted into sources of profit by the application of labor. This activity is relentless because the drive to maximize profits and the corollary drive to accumulate capital is also relentless under capitalism. It's a law. In fact, in some respects, it's literally a law. I mean, the laws of many states basically say that you know, a corporation has to uh, cater to the interests of their shareholders, right? What does that mean? It means profit maximization. The whole legal structure is geared toward this, right? Relentless accumulation is the only way for capitalists to maintain their position as capitalists. If they play the nice guy capitalist too much, they can be driven out of business. And so the system as a whole drives all capitalists to relentlessly accumulate, 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 grow, grow, grow without, without any concern for the consequences. So with that, we want to kind of get into the final part of our presentation and three examples of how capitalism lies at the root of social ills. And what we're going to do, we're going to kind of go back and forth on this one between me and Mel. I'm going to just kind of give the broad overview. And then Mel wants to give some uh, more specific examples uh, from her own experience. So the one we want to talk, the first one we want to talk about is persistent poverty. You know, this is, this is an obscenity that we, we observe, you know, the richest nation on earth. And yet we have 140 million poor and low income people in the United States today right? That's over 40% of the population is poor. You can't go by the official poverty statistics. You got to look beyond that. And this is something that's persisted for years. It's gotten worse, but even the official poverty rate has been between 10 and 15% for 50 years. So we know it's persistent. There's empirical proof of it. Uh, if we look globally, of course, the situation is even worse. 10% of the world's population living on, on or trying to live on less than $2 a day, rampant malnutrition and so on. It is getting worse overall. Average real wages in the United States have been in general decline since 1974. And even though you do have pockets where there's a demand for higher, highly skilled labor, where wages go up in this sector or that here and there, overall, that's been the, the, the trend. And at the same time, you've seen you know, these growth in these low wage sectors like financial services, the gig economy, and what I call the guard economy, where more and more capitalist firms hire people to police other workers, right? 
Oh, well, with that, let me let me turn it over to Mel. I think you wanted to talk about a, a more specific example. Oh, I can go ahead and uh, if you want to finish uh, what you're doing, I'll, I'll tie it all oh, back. Oh, to yeah, we can do it that way. All right, yeah. that sounds fine. Yeah. Uh, the second example I want to talk about is environmental dis devastation. And of course, not just the climate crisis, but all environmental dis devastation, you could, whether you're talking about plastics pollution and, and the horrific things happening there, the endocrine disruptors in the environment, all these horrific things that we're dealing with. Well, we've already covered the fact that there's this relentless drive to accumulate as a central feature of capitalism. And that means consuming nature's bounty as rapidly as possible if it can be turned into a profit without worrying about the next generation, right? Uh, they, they don't have future focus, right? <laughs> like, like greens do. Uh, this is about maximizing profit now. And if, if the gravy train runs dry, you just invest in the next thing. That's what capitalism does these days. But the profit motive also requires capitalists to view the natural world as a dumping ground for waste. We, you know, you, you've heard the phrase, I'm sure most of us have heard the phrase externalizing the costs, right? Uh, basically, the reason why there's so much environmental devastation is number one, there's this rampant extraction that's absolutely reckless and doesn't care about the consequences to, to living things, including human beings. And then there's also the fact that the capitalists have a profit incentive to use the natural world as their dumping ground. In, in general, it is simply more profitable to pollute than not to pollute because in order to, uh, to protect the environment from the discharge of effluents, whether it's greenhouse gases or anything else, that costs more money. And if they can get by doing it at less cost, that is what they're going to do because that's what the profit motive tells them to do. And then the third example is we've all heard of the forever wars. They're still going on Afghanistan for 20 straight freaking years uh, and so on. Still in Iraq, still in Syria, devastated Libya, uh, devastating the countries of, of Latin America. Uh, why? Why does this happen? Well, there's, there's several contributing causes that, that emanate from capitalism. First of all, drive to control resources we've already talked about, drive to control markets. The more markets you control, the more you can sell, the more profit you can make. Sources of cheaper labor than, than what is available in, in uh, the home country. And then also new dumping ground for waste. All of these are incentives for the capitalists in the most developed nation states to use the power of the state that they control uh, to build up their military power as well as use their economic power to control the governments of less developed and less powerful nation states. If they resist imperialism, and today we, US, the United States is the leading imperialist power, uh, if arguably the sole imperialist power, but certainly the worst, and, and uh, they have all manner of means. They, they, it, it's not always war. Sometimes it's the threat of war. Uh, it's the use of the CIA, the National Endowment for Democracy, covert operations, economic sanctions. All of these tools are used in order to dominate these, invade the sovereignty of other nations, dominate their governments, and obtain the desired political results. At the same time, in the home front, the military industrial congressional complex provides an especially profitable and never ending vehicle for corporate welfare and obscene levels of state subsidized profiteering. We all know about that. Northrop Grumman, McDonnell Douglas, Raytheon, right? All, all of these uh, huge corporations uh, that are able to benefit from cost plus contracting, this keeps the wheels of militarism flowing. So. At, at the same time, some corporate entities benefit from that. They're also helping their brother cor corporate entities profiteer from their activities overseas. So these are, I would argue, these are the fundamental reasons why imperialism and war have been constant features of capitalism throughout its history. And if you look at the US, especially World War II, and since then, it has been constant and relentless. And these are the main drivers of it. So those are the three things I want to talk about. And now I think, Mel, you wanted to talk about some more specific examples. 
Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Rich, for that. Um, I know we wanted to leave some uh, some time for discussion. And so what I'd like to do is just very quickly go into a case study, right, of how all of these, you know, kind of uh, concepts, these histories, all of this stuff work in a particular place. So, um, so I'm in Northern California, um, otherwise known as that part of California nobody remembers exists unless it's on fire. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, just seven miles from me, uh, the most uh, devastating wildfire in California's history ripped through the town of Paradise, um, you know, uh, basically burning down the entire town and displacing 42,000 people. And so um, all of this and everything that has happened after, um, you know, capitalism is such a part of the uh, both the devastation itself and of the um, recovery process, which has been completely unequal. So um, I'm going to start with a little bit of history. And this is one of the things when you're trying to think about how capitalism has ruined your particular ecosystem, it's really uh, useful to go into the history of your place. And so um, so here's Northern California. And um, so I'm in sort of this part uh, up here. Um, like I said, this part that like nobody really remembers unless it's on fire. and. Um, and this part of Northern California, of course, has been part of the capitalist extractive economy ever since it's been California. Of course, for tens of thousands of years before that, it was native land. O over 300 uh, tribes and thousands of tribelets lived in this area. And almost from jump, right, almost from jump, because uh, the, the Spanish never really got into Northern California. Spanish uh, colonized a lot of Southern California, but it wasn't really until the 1840s that uh, Europeans got to the Northern and Sierra regions. And of course, what did they do? Of course, was the gold rush, right? So the gold rush was the very first capitalist economy um, in Northern California, and it was an extractive one. It was one that relied on the genocide, uh, the paid state sanctioned, the state finance genocide of the, the original stewards of this land. Um, There's also tons of mercury because mercury is the element that separates gold from its ore. So there is not one watershed in California. Every creek, every river, every stream in California has been poisoned with mercury. It has been dredged for gold. Um, basically all the watersheds in the state were basically ruined by 1883. Um, uh, and so that's just a very short period of time. Um, after the gold rush, of course, the, the, there needed to be more profit made. And so all of those devastated watersheds were replanted with timber trees, not the fire adapted native, you know, fire resistant trees that were already adapted to this landscape, but highly flammable conifers, pines, Douglas fir, uh, all the stuff that's in your houses and your furniture today. Right. And so, you know, for much of the 19th century and much of the 20th century, logging uh, replaced the native ecosystems of Northern California with timber plantations, meaning many hundreds of trees per acre, way more uh, uh, dense than uh, normally happens, a lot of non fire adapted invasive species. And this set us up for the devastating wildfires that we have seen every year, um, especially in the last several years. And then finally, water. All of those polluted watersheds also got channeled into dams, into reservoirs, so that the private enterprise and the, so basically, this is also the state subsidizing private enterprise uh, to basically take the water from the Sierras, take all of that water in Northern California and ship it down to Kern County, which is naturally a desert to grow you know, those, those cute mandarins and the, the, and the, and the pomegranates and the pistachios um, that, that, and that all goes down to literally two people, Stuart and Linda Resnick. We, we have, they have names and addresses of who is literally stealing billions of, 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 of uh, dollars of water, right, from our watersheds. So, um, so the, this sort of panoply of colonial, 
capitalist extractive industry has changed the entire ecosystem of California. And so when native people say our apocalypse um, began 180 years ago, what they're saying is that the environmental devastation and the consequences of capitalist industry uh, are, are able to be seen on the landscape and every single fall it's on fire. Um, everybody knows it. Um, and what has, how has this, oops, there we go. How, um, so this has threatened the state um, ecologically, right? By removing the human stewards uh, of the of this landscape through native genocide, uh, removing the traditional ecological knowledge that allowed people to live in this region without the threat of fire, uh, fire suppression, right? Uh, good fire or cultural fire was the keystone of this fire adapted ecosystem. And that was all destroyed. Uh, the destruction of watersheds and the overgrowth of inappropriate species. And this of, of course led to the, um, uh, and of course all of the, if you look at the state, right? Um, basically, if we, could, if we look at this as a flow of profit, right? This flow of profit goes from all of these red counties into this blue county here, which is the Bay Area, and it goes down to Los Angeles, right? So if you think of like California as a giant vacuum, just sucking all the resources from the, the non-urban parts of California into the urban parts of California, we still have a very colonial relationship between natural resources and profit making. And this has um, uh, of course, resulted in in incredibly in unequ incredible inequality and poverty. Um, it has it, uh, uh, resulted in unemployment, especially as these industries boom and bust, and food insecurity. It's no accident that the poorest communities in California and the most food insecure uh, areas in California are the, the areas that produce the most food. Those workers, right, do not get the fruits of their labor. They're literal, like they don't get the actual fruits. <laughs> like <laughs> they're, they're, they're um, you know, uh, um, so, so that is, um, that's a huge problem as well. Uh, the last thing I want to talk a little bit about is now, Rich alluded to it in terms of this capitalist crisis, and that capitalists, once if they're if they're not making as much profit from the usual means, try to seek out other ways of making money, and a lot of that is produced through political control of the state and the state coffers. And we see this happening now today through um, what's called disaster capitalism. And the way that works is that you have you know these wonderful people um, on the uh, Senate subcommittee on federal spending and emergency management. So when a fire rips through or when a flood rips through or when, you know, there's a drought or when there's, you know, some of, uh, you know, bad water in Flint, Michigan, these emergencies are called and all of a sudden FEMA and these uh, uh, agencies come and they fund and they do billions and hundreds of billions of dollars in contracts to private corporations. Oh yeah, Jared Kushner, I've had that before. Um, but e even like in the coronavirus, they'll say market research, right? That is something very specifically attached to this market allocation of things that we need to survive like coronavirus treatments and vaccines, right? Um, you have also, so this private contracting basically goes, um, there are these companies like Tetra Tech that, that are called in the industry ambulance chasers because they go from disaster to disaster to disaster, basically like going and, and, and grabbing these, con these government contracts and making billions and billions of dollars off of it. And this has, you know, uh, uh, it's basically a racket. Um, and so this is another thing to, oops, sorry, to kind of, uh, that's the alternative. Um, um, uh, so this is, you know, basically the racket that has now emerged um, as I think capitalism's adaptation to climate uh, to the climate crisis, and this is absolutely something that that um, uh, that especially if you know we're working on getting candidates elected and all of this, this is stuff that um, you need to have your eye on. Okay, so um, 
Um, and the last thing, oh, the, one of the, I didn't have a slide for it, but the last thing I want to mention is uh, that goes to Rich's point about uh, imperialism is, um, you know, thinking about, be, especially because a lot of green uh, solutions are predicated on things like solar, things like clean energy, electric cars, etc. But a lot of people don't understand that the lithium that goes into the batteries for the electric cars comes from Bolivia. Right. And I don't know how many people uh, go on Twitter, but uh, somebody literally confronted Elon Musk about this. And he said, we can coup whoever we want. Right. And so the overthrow of, of, of Evo Morales, that coup that removed him from power in Bolivia was actually directly, directly related to the growth of the electric car industry. And that's something that we want, we need to think about because as eco-socialists, one of the big things we need to look out for is what we call green capitalism, right? And green capitalism um, is often at the forefront of imperialist adventures around the world. All right, so we've talked way long enough. So I want to open it up to you all um, to do like a, so a discussion period, um, any clarifying questions. I know we put a lot of material out here. Um, so what I'd like to do is to just sort of moderate this. Um, if you would like to speak and have a question, please write the word stack into the chat box. And so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, sort of make a stack and um, and then uh, I will uh, I'll I'll unmute um, each of you uh, in the in turn. So basically, first come first serve. So first, I want to sort of throw it out there in terms of there's there any clarifying questions, any things. I know Rich and I put a lot of material out there, but if this, if it, anything is confusing to folks, you want clarifying uh, questions, please um, uh, 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 put you know stack in the chat. So we see I have Margaret Kimberly's already on. On stack. Um, so go ahead, Margaret, with your comment. Hi, well, first, uh, thank you, uh, Mel and, and Rich. I, I learned quite a lot uh, from, uh, from you both. I had no idea that so much uh, uh, lumber in California isn't even native. That seemed to be what you were saying, right? That they brought in non-native species. I, I'm a little embarrassed I didn't know that. But um, I just want to know in your explanation of uh, the beginnings of capitalism, uh, it was about Europe. And I was just wondering if that analysis applies anywhere else in the world. How do we, how do we talk about exploitation non-capitalist societies? So do you have any, any comments about that? Absolutely. Um, yeah, it goes right back to the land. And Rosa Luxemburg went into this when she talked about the origins of colonialism. It started in England, but it certainly did not um, uh, uh, stay there. The idea of commodifying land, of, of taking what was uh, common to, as a, and a community resource, which, you know, basically all indigenous groups all over the world lived like that, um, you know, having common grounds and common resources, um, the privatization of those resources, basically the part of the genesis of the colonialist adventure, right? And so, um, you know, uh, uh, all over the planet, um, you know, indigenous peoples lost their land, were driven off their land, were enslaved and made to buy their land uh, because land is a means of production. And so um, imperialism is absolutely, you know, part, uh, I, I think, a, a, a process of that, what Marx called the primitive accumulation process as well. So I hope that clarifies things. But what do you call, I, I guess my, my question is, what do you call the exploitation that's is there a term or a way to explain exploitation that's not capitalist? Um, I mean, exploitation, right? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. yeah, you can have, you can have, you can have comprador bourgeoisies, you can have dictatorships, um, you know, feudalism, right, was a, was a, a, a form of exploitation, but it was not because of control of the means of production. It was because of political and extra, uh, you know, they, they'd send people to burn your village if you didn't pay your taxes, right? Um, so that's a form of exploitation. Capitalist exploitation is very s historically specific to ownership of the means of production. I hope that clarifies things. Thanks. Yeah, let me, let me just add that, you know, except for what has, been called primitive communalism or the type of communalism that was practiced by 
in indigenous peoples, first world peoples, uh, or first nations peoples uh, for for millennia, when the when civilization right first started, we had different forms of oppression, uh, uh, you know, of exploitation, right? Chattel slavery obviously is a form of exploitation, but it takes a different form. It's in the direct ownership of human beings. Uh, feudalism, the paying of tribute, right? That's a form of exploitation. So you are correct that any class divided society has some form of exploitation. What we've been talking about is the type that's specific to capitalism based on wage labor. Does anyone else and, want and to make square, a- yeah. uh, Scare quotes around primitive communalism. Yes. I, I like, well, it's not, it's, in a way, it's more advanced. And, and in a way, it's what we want to return to is, is a, a communal society. Right. All right. Um, does anyone have a, another uh, like comment or a question? Uh, I do want to throw this out there, just you know, um, kind of related to what we're talking about, that land justice right, land justice, being able to decommodify, have some kind of decommodified land on this continent, right, is, um, is a huge, um, you know, is a huge uh, issue. And it's something that's not talked about in the United States. It's talked about in almost everywhere else in the world. Almost every socialist uh, revolution has included some kind of land reform. And um, we don't, you know, it's been so ingrained in our heads, private property, that it, it's, you know, it's, it's very hard to extract in this particular society. All right, Steve Bloom is on stack. Go ahead, Steve. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. Um, I take as a given everything that Mel and Rich have presented. Um, I, I can raise quibbles here that I won't. Um, but the question for tonight is, why is capitalism the problem with a capital T? And I, this will be challenged from two points of view, one of which I'm very sympathetic to, the other which I think is easily responded to, but it, they need to be posed. The first one is, um, well, this is all true of capitalism hysterically, but through this reform or that reform or this, you know, regulation, we can shift it, especially on the ecological questions and make it more eco-friendly. Um, that I think is the fundamental response is the question of growth, which is impossible. You can't regulate growth out of a capitalist economy. But here is the thing that I'm really sympathetic to which is the deep green kind of perspective will say, all of this is really inherent in human society since the development of class society, where people began to see the natural world as theirs to exploit. And capitalism is only the most recent and most virulent expression of that. Um, so we would have to say that capitalism is the most important problem as opposed to capitalism is the problem. So uh, as I say, I am sympathetic to that point of view because I think there is something beyond capitalism which we have to grapple with as we deal with this. But I'd like to hear the responses from Mel and Rich to those. Sure, I can, I can respond to that because I'm wearing the shirt. <laughs> Um, one of the things about the deep green perspective, and I, and I started out as an environmentalist in the deep in the deep green movement, and my um, my 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 perspective shifted once I be, started to actually understand the systems of that indigenous peoples have actually um, have used over the years. Um, you know, especially on this continent, especially in North America. What we think of as wild was not wild. Like in, in many, many indigenous languages, including the ones that my family taught me, we do not have a word for wild. There was no separation between humans and nature. And in fact, 
um, you know, uh, what we call land management today was agriculture, was agriculture, right? And we have to go back to our definitions of what human nature is, what agriculture is, and what productivity is, right? Um, and that's one of the reasons that traditional ecological knowledge is often not recognized even by environmentalists, right? It's either you live in with no impact on nature, which is impossible, by the way, right? You can't exist without having an impact on nature, right? Because you are nature. And uh, number two, um, we, uh, so a lot of these attitudes about the separation of people from nature, about the domination of people from nature, it's not unique to capitalism, but it is necessary to maintain capitalism. And things like, like I said, land justice, common management of resources, these things are, um, uh, have, have been, you know, worked out over tens of thousands of years of human existence on this planet by communities. And, um, and you know, some of them are more successful, were more successful than others, but it's all trial and error. And to say that um, sort of civilization writ large, um, you know, is, is the problem uh, reflects a, a not complete understanding of indigenous civilizations. That's my, um, my response to that. Yeah, and just to add on to that, I think that there, there's a, a common uh, tendency to misidentify how people behave when they've been conditioned uh, to function under a certain social system and call that human nature. Uh, you know, if you grow up in a system, if you grow up in the fishbowl and you're taught that the way to get ahead is to step on other people, and you know the the way to get ahead is to compete and violence is is you know part of our way of life and it's it inundates you in the culture all of these things that uh, acculturate and condition people to behave in a way that is helpful to the capitalist system is not human nature it's just human training and it and it's it's a human conditioning but it's not human nature and we know this because as Mel rightly pointed out, indigenous peoples have lived different ways. You know, they have uh, uh, functioned in a communal way. We know human beings are able to uh, function communally. And even under capitalism, we see the capacity of human beings to cooperate time and time again. You know, whether it's during a disaster, helping your neighbor, uh, those kinds of things, you know, or, or, or just, within the workplace, workers have to cooperate, right? There's all kinds of examples. Human beings have the capacity to be violent or nonviolent. They have the capacity to exploit or to be fair and cooperate. They have all of these capacities. The question is, what does the social system encourage them or condition them to do? It's, it's not human nature. Obviously, this is a big subject. We could go into quite a bit on that, but that would be my short answer that uh, it's a mistake to associate how people behave under capitalism, living in that environment that, that produces certain kinds of behaviors and call that human nature. Yeah, I, I, if I could just add, you won't get any argument from me, Rich, on the question of human nature. I've written on this and, and, and I agree with you 100%. What I said was I'm sympathetic to the deep green perspective, not that I identify with it. I identify as an eco-socialist, but I think there are elements of that deep green perspective that we have to acknowledge and try to synthesize into our deep green perspective. I date the thing from the emergence of class society, which means all of the examples of indigenous cultures are before the moment that I would say this exploitation of neighbor begins of, of nature begins to have an impact on human cultures. But then you also have the exceptions even with indigenous cultures. I mean, Easter Island was not capitalism. It was created by an indigenous culture. So we have all of these things that we have to somehow integrate into our understanding and amplify our understanding with, not fundamentally change it about what capitalism and what it does or where it comes from. 
Thank you for that, Steve. And and for those of you who are Gen members, um, you know, I'd be happy to start a, a discussion on this on our discussion uh, uh, um, platform and um, to go to go into some of the uh, the the you know particularities around this. But um, I'd like to yeah throw it out to see if there's any. Uh, we got 15 minutes left, so um, if anyone wants to respond to any of the points that have been made. Um, you know, you don't just have to Q and A with us. Um, you know, we're we've been lecturing for a long time. You know, I, I'd like to hear you now. Um, I'm tired of hearing my own voice. Um, but um, yes, uh, um, if if those of you who are not Gen members would like to um, to to join uh, uh, the Green Eco Socialist Network, go to the um, the link that Rich has posted in the chat, eco-socialism.org click on join and contribute and uh, we are a dues paying organization um but the the dues are not you know they're, they're not too onerous um but uh but you can join us uh you can we have monthly membership meetings uh we plan to have monthly educational events such as this one and we also have uh discussions online uh, uh in between so um you know part of what we would like to do with the green eco socialist network is also you know to to gain um sort of some analytic uh, uh clarity so that we can put it towards action i know all of you are involved in many many causes and many um uh, 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 you know, electoral uh, struggles and all kinds of struggles, and and you know, it's a it's a it's a good space to be in for us to dip into these questions and dive into these questions uh, in a deeper way than we usually um, uh, are able to. So, um, so uh, yeah, so there is also um, there is also a uh, a link too if you cannot pay if you you know no one's turned away for lack of funds so um you know on the join and contribute page just click on what you are able and um or or say you know i would like to request a waiver or something like that and and it'll go to us okay thank you um all right so deborah davidson uh let me do i have to there we are there you are um, oh, there's two of you. Oh, two I will of you. unmute I will you both. Unmute you both. Or I'll just unmute oh, one just, of you. Oh, just, oh, can you mute one? Okay, <laughs> I'll mute. I'll unmute the other one. Try that one. Oops. Explain getting from point A to point B, from where we are as a capitalist society to um, uh, a better way of living. Um, sorry, De Deborah, sure, we, sure. I missed the first part of your question, but um, I think part of it is how do we get from here to there is sort of the gist of your question. Okay. Um, oops. Uh, if you want, I can take a stab at that. Uh, and, you. Uh, but uh, basically, you know, we're, we're trying to, for, well, we're doing a couple of things. First of all, we're trying to, within the Green Party, build on the progress that was made in 2016 when some eco-socialist language was added to the platform. And we, we, we saw that there was majoritarian support for that uh, within the National Green Party. But it's obviously more than just the Green Party. We're not, we're not we don't, I don't think any of us believes that simply electing more Greens to office is, is going to uh, create the new society. But there are a lot of things happening under the surface of capitalist society today in what's broadly called the solidarity economy movement. Uh, groups like uh, Cooperation Humboldt, Cooperation Jackson, the, the movement for workers co cooperatives, the Democracy Collaborative, uh, there, there are a number of organizations that are doing this work of building new worker-controlled institutions in communities around the country. Now, that in and of itself is not going to change the fundamentals. It's basically a way to better survive under capitalism. But there is potential in this movement, we believe, in if it can be, if it can take a political expression and start to make changes at the macro level, 
uh, so that you can start having planning bodies and basically build institutions of dual power uh, that will that will be able to challenge the capitalist order of things, the capitalist system. We think there is a lot of potential. Now, how the concrete steps you go from there to here, nobody has a magic formula. We have ideas. Uh, we believe that using the state, using the political system to uh, basically strengthen these worker-owned institutions, it would, would certainly be a logical step. Uh, we also are having an ongoing discussion about the role of what are called non-reformist reforms, reforms that can be enacted now, but also help us transition into a new economic democracy, a, a new cooperative commonwealth, the kind of system that we really want to see uh, created. So uh, this is, it, it's, it's a matter of praxis, right? You, you, you have to, you learn by doing, you learn by putting your theory into practice, and then you learn from the practice about how to improve your efforts to try to build this new society. There is no one blueprint that's laid out for us. We have to find it. Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, just to sort of hook this into Steve's question too, like just as there are a incredible, almost infinite diversity of societies that lived upon the land in different ways, um, there are also uh, a lot of ways. And, you know, for me being, you know, proponent of traditional ecological knowledge is very place-based. And so, you know, part of what um, you know, these tools can be useful for us to look at your place, you know, uh, Rich is in Illinois, I'm going to tell him what's going, you know, how to do things in Illinois, because I don't live there, right? Uh, but um, I'm wondering, you know, I'd love to, to hear from, from the rest of you all about how um, you are currently, you know, uh, uh, fighting privatization, commodification, wage labor, uh, you know, profit maximization and market allocation in your area. Um, you know, where, where we live is, you know, and, and, and knowing where we live, work and play is, is uh, uh, you know, uh, more important now than ever. And, um, you know, fighting capitalism is, is not a one-off solution, but uh, uh, if, you know, there's a thousand of these fights, we can take it down like, uh, like the Lilliputians took down Gulliver. So I'd love to hear from you all. How are you fighting the five pillars of capitalism in your area? Anyone? Uh, you just go, go ahead and put stack in the chat if you. Um. Okay, um, so let's go to, I'm gonna take uh, dots of first and then go back to Margaret. Oops, uh, let me find you, hold on, sorry. There we go, oh, you got it? Hey, hey Dr. can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I never I know whether I'm, I'm connected to the world or not. I'm living in the woods. Um, that's part of my retirement. Um, I'm getting my bearings back. Um, I sort of lost it over the last couple of years. I, uh, I uh, kind of guess I had a nervous breakdown, but mostly I just was not well. Um, but in moving here and retiring, I took with me all of the tools that I've been gathering um, uh, in the Green Party mostly, but also through time banks and other share um, uh, notions. And I'm, I'm unbelievably fortunate and privileged to have um, inherited 12 acres in the woods here. Um, but it, it's not a, a very, a huge country um, living kind of situation. I mean, it's very populated. There's a lot of houses on the lake. I mean, it, there's a house on every inch around this lake, right? Um, but there is a good amount of woods and a lot of people who are, are basically conservative and fiscally conservative. So they, they follow a different 
a political path, but everybody's looking at how to be there for their neighbor because everybody knows that, you know, we, we are, you know, empire is failing and, and people are seeing it and they're just reacting to it in very different ways. But a place where people can bring and leave and come back and get and borrow and share um, the, the tools, the, the food, the clothing, you know, anything that anybody would need. We have a space where we're going to be able to provide that as well as a place and a space where people can um, come and talk, come and read, come and, and uh, uh, revitalize, so to speak. And so it, it is really just to, to give back all of the information and the, and the love that I've gotten over these, these years back to a community here in Southern Michigan um, that, that I had hoped to come back to. And I'm glad that I'm still alive to be able to come back to this community here. So um, I don't know how it's going to look, but it's certainly um, excited a, a number of people who are here of all sorts of political persuasions. So um, that makes me feel happy and hopeful. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Margaret, and then Keenan. I think that will be at time after. Okay, so I'll just go quickly since I already spoke. I think the, one of the things you can do is just call it what it is. Um, you know, don't dance around it. Don't beat around the bush and stop voting for capitalists. Stop supporting these people. There's no harm reduction. There's no uh, lesser evil. That's it. That's my, my last words. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Margaret. Um, so, Keenan? Yeah, um, I... Uh... I came in a, um, a little bit like, I guess, 10 minutes late and I, I heard, um, I'm not sure if you, you mentioned something, you were talking something about this, but um, the distinction, if there is a distinction to ma be made between capitalism and markets um, and, you know, also in terms of mass production, is there a point in which, you know, the sometimes mass production, you know, has a certain level, can have a certain level of, of efficiency to it that maybe is um, ecologically beneficial, but is there, but uh, of course there's also a point in which it's just destructive. Um, and also about, you know, in terms of costs of things and what price prices mean, you know, in, in socialism and how that is really decided is, um, Something that I think that when I run into, you know, locally uh, talking about uh, socialism, I'm in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. So, you know, it's, it's you know, has been kind of alien <laughs> here to that. Um, but of course, the conditions that exist, people are definitely more open to uh, at least criticizing capitalism at this point. But the, the vision of, you know, even what would it, getting how how it's it's difficult to get through to people um into even uh believing that there is really any other way um that's one thing um but it also in terms of what i do i i do have a i did run as a green party candidate here um but i um i got a sustain a degree in sustainability and <laughs> they teach capitalism there. <laughs> they teach green yeah. capitalism like crazy there. Um, but I, I did start a project based off of that um, called the People's Water Power um, that when you were talking, when I came in, uh, the, you were talking about dams, mentioned about dams. And that is the reason why I started doing this project is because um, there is a, I mean, water is, it's the potential for a hunt, you know, 24 um, seven. But of course, doing it in a way that isn't blocking up rivers. So that's, that's what my, my project has been about. But so far, uh, it's been difficult for me to really reach other people in wanting to participate uh, 
in working on it. Um, you know, so that's what I have to, and my, my question though too, I would like to ask, thanks, over. Great. Um, so I, I could take on sort of the first part of that question in terms of like how to talk to people about eco-socialism and what that looks like because um, with the possible exception of Cuba uh, <laughs> and, and where Bolivia was starting to go, um, eco-socialism is not um, the same as the, you know, um, quote unquote, uh, as, as the, as what people have, um, say, caricatured as socialism. Um, you know, a, a big part is economic and political democracy. Um, so things like what Rich was talking about, the solidarity economy, um, those are things that are very legible to people. Um, like in terms of like what Dotson was saying, helping each other, helping you know people survive, going back to community, that kind of thing. But um, but you know they don't. I mean, there's a, there's a uh, that's it's a big question, and like un unfortunately we're out of time. But um, you know uh, um, I would say just go back to go back to the five pillars and think about sort of again why these things are detrimental, and on the flip side, what can make what you know what how do you how do we attack those five pillars to make a more beneficial society so so something like markets right i mean you know you don't necessarily uh, uh i don't think capitalism is the same as just like a market like the farmer's market right uh, you can have like a farmer's market without capitalism but you have to look at one of those pillars market allocation if the market is what decides how people gets the things that they need to survive and you cannot survive without that market allocation then i think we're in a in a capitalism problem right um uh, uh um oh so somebody's asking me is about bolivia um i gripes with bolivia uh, i have a gripe with overthrowing a democratically elected government um uh in terms of bolivian uh, eco-socialism uh uh there's a whole host of things that I, I just don't want to go into right now but um, but I hope that 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 helps um, at least as a sort of general answer to your question um, in terms of looking at these five pillars thinking about how that affects where you're at and thinking about what the alternative is giving people an out I think is a is 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 um, useful to me as an organizer um, you know like I like I said like if if the only alternative to capitalist uh, 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 existence on this planet is like a no, uh, leave no trace type of uh, 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 impact on this planet. Um, that doesn't give people a lot of options. You know, um, that's why I'm a big proponent of TEK because these are systems that um, where you make sure you leave a beneficial impact, leave this planet better than, than, than how you found it. You know, um, uh, these things are, um, and 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 how to do that um, in in a way that doesn't um, that you know does not lead to the like exploitation and degradation is um, it's a it's a big it's a tall order but I think it's some things that people are answering in very innovative and uh, uh, and uplifting ways. So. The only thing I would add to that, Mel, is uh, you know Keenan raises a big subject because. I think, you know, how a eco-socialist society would uh, engage in the distribution of products is not something that's been widely discussed. And you'll even see proponents of what's called market socialism, right? Where you can keep the markets, but you're just changing the, the way in which goods and services are produced and so on. I'm not convinced that that's the way to go, however. I, uh, you know, you can, I think, envision other ways of distribution of product. Uh, if you have a cooperative society where a plan for distribution of the goods and services people need is part of the democratic planning pl process that takes place. What I think we're, we're united on is we don't want to go to a command economy model where, you know, the, the question of who does the planning is pretty important, right? Uh, if, if it's if it's a, a top down uh, party run state, that's that's something that we we want to try to avoid. 
but there are ways, uh, other ways in which we can plan for an equitable distribution of the products of labor. The, the basic guide is we wanna be producing for use and need, not producing for profit and for sale on a market. I mean, that's, that's, but that's kind of a generality, right? How do you concretely do that? That's something we need to wrestle with uh, in all honesty. And I, it's something that I think will emerge out of the struggle to create this kind of new society. But I don't think it's an impossible thing. I mean, uh, you know, already even within the solidarity economy that exists now, there, there are mechanisms for people to trade their labor with one at labor exchanges. Um, you know, alter, uh, alternative currency being one manifestation of that. There are other ways in which we could do that. I think what you have raised is a question that would probably be a very good subject for a future full-on discussion. Absolutely. All right, we are out of time. We are more than out of time. So I wanna thank everyone for, uh, for coming to this uh, to this event. Um, again, eco-socialism.org if you want to get in with uh, the Green Eco-Socialist Network and hear more about our events. Also like our Facebook page. Um, uh, we didn't live stream this, but uh, we did record it. So, um, you know, I, I can look into posting it. And um, we can also, um, we have all of your emails, I believe. So we can send out a follow-up email with PDF versions of the uh, presentations if you'd like those um, for your notes. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, have a wonderful rest of the day or the evening and uh, we'll hopefully see you next month. Thanks. Very good, take care, thank you. Bye, take care. Peace.